Lord Jesus, with so much going on here with graduations and, and moving from the end of school, beginning of summer, and families coming in and out, and vacations happening, that there's a, there's a lot of distraction, Lord. And I pray your Holy Spirit now will dial us down. Lord Jesus, help us to settle in to hear your word today. I believe this is a necessary word, and I, and I receive it, Father, as having already heard it. But, Father, as we go through this together with this, this fellowship second hour, I pray no less will be given than what you gave first hour. That your call would be no less important. That not a single one of us will miss what you have to say to us today. Father, give us clear minds and open hearts. And Spirit be our teacher, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at the exploits of Elijah. Kind of walking through some things in his life, his fantastic triumphs and his powerful prayer life. And even his mid-ministry crisis, we covered that on Wednesday night. You might be surprised to learn that Elijah was a man who went through burnout. He got pride, not on the good things of, of ministry, or not, not on the bad things, but on the good things. It was the good things that wore him out, surprisingly. It was the mountaintop experiences. It was all the great blessings. It was all the power. And by the time he'd gone through three and a half years of powerful experiences, he was just spent. And we talked about a little bit on Wednesday night how sometimes the miracles that we would chase after are not what give us strength. Rather, it's the quiet and it's the rest. And it's being in the presence of the Lord. Well, this morning we're going to take kind of a, a detour. We're going to come back to visit with Elijah some more, but not today. 1 Kings chapter 20 is somewhat of an interruption because Elijah is absent. But it's also an interruption because through the mouthpieces of an unnamed prophet and an unnamed man of God, we get to sit ringside as the Lord continues his pattern of what you could call divine intrusion. Where the Lord divinely intrudes upon the kings of Israel. This is an ongoing pattern with the Lord and these kings. He interferes with their politics. He invades their pentagons. That is their military council. He intrudes upon their personal life. He just won't leave wicked enough alone. These kings have made a choice. They are rebellious. They are chasing after other gods. They are worshiping the Baals. And yet God won't stop in his pursuit of them. He goes after them, these wayward kings, tirelessly. Aren't you glad we have a father like that? I'll tell you what, I need God to chase me down. Because I'm constantly wandering off. I am so thankful for conviction. And I'm thankful that I have a father who won't let me rest stupid and and ignorant into the things of, of his will. A father who comes after me time and time again when I wander off, when I get into the stupid realm of my life, and he comes barreling in there intruding upon my private life, I am so thankful that he does this. He's not meaning to nag. He just loves you. And that's the kind of Lord we have. And we see this with the kings. This morning, God's story is an intrusion upon King Ahab. Through two separate wars with the Aramean people, which are the Syrians of today, the Arameans, Ahab will go up against him and the Lord will show himself to be God. But the instrument he uses to show himself to be God will not be Elijah as it was on Mount Carmel. That awesome stalwart prophet. Oh, the people watched Elijah as he called down fire from heaven. And he had quite a reputation. And God used this man of righteousness whose prayers availeth much to show his glory. Well, he's going to show his glory again, but not through a great prophet. He's going to show his glory through a wicked king. Why? Why would God stoop to show himself to be God, to prove Yahweh is God, through the tool of Ahab? Well, as you're going to hear in verses 13 and 28, the Lord intrudes upon Ahab to bring about a miraculous victory for Ahab so that they will know that I am the Lord. 
It's one thing to look at Elijah and say God worked through him, and when we see God revealed there, it's another thing to work, look at a guy like Ahab, who is a complete spiritual loser, and yet God shows himself to be Lord even through this king. Why is it that we see this holy tag phrase so much? And you'll see it when we get to the book of Ezekiel eventually. 26 times in that prophetic book, Ezekiel will say, the, the Lord will say through the mouth of his prophet, then they will know that I am the Lord. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Over and over and over. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Why is the Lord so consistently persistent in demanding that people, even rebellious Israel, and evil King Ahab, and even some of us, why does he keep persisting that we acknowledge he is Lord? And you know the answer to that. It's only by acknowledging him as Lord that a man can be saved. And God is concerned first and foremost with salvation. More than any other thing in your life and mine, whether you can call yourself a Christian this morning or not, more than any other thing, the Lord would say, I want you home. I want you saved. It's more important to me than your present comfort. What is, Lord? Your eternal condition. That matters more than any other thing to the Lord. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. He says we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Because, gang, to know Jesus as Lord is to accept His authority. It's to say, yes, Lord, I will be an obedient servant of yours. Yes, I will follow you. And to Austin and to Jordan, today I say to both of you guys, that is the pattern for a life that's worth living. A life lived in obedience to the Lord. Not to your parents, although you should. Especially Austin, you, I'm just telling you. <laughs> not to people around you, not to a future wife. Your obedience to the Lord will secure your life in a way nothing else can. The same is true for all of us. To know Jesus is to accept his full, listen to me, his full authority over my life. The problem is with many of us, we accept a partial authority. Jesus is Lord every Sunday. Jesus is Lord every time I open my Bible. Jesus is Lord when I gather with other Christians and other believers. Yeah, Jesus is Lord. But it's a partial lordship. He wants a complete lordship. Well, let's look at the story this morning. 1 Kings chapter 20, and verse 1. It says, Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, he gathered all his army, and there were 32 kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. Samaria is the capital of the kingdom of Israel. Ahab is the king. Ben-Hadad's name means son of the shouter. We'll just call him Big Mouth this morning, okay? And it is a tendency, even today among Arabic people to talk big. It, it, it's part of just the nature. And we've seen this work against Israel many times. Back in 1948 in the War of Independence, boy, the Arab nations surrounding Israel were talking big. We're going to do this in a day. We're going to wipe them right into the sea and be done with the Jewish menace. And such was not the case. But this king of Aram is very much a, a big mouth king. He's very much counting his eggs before they hatch. You'll see this happen. As we read on verse 2, he sent messengers to the city of Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and your gold are mine. Your most beautiful wives and your children are also mine. And the king of Israel replied, somewhat wimpily, I might add, It is according to your word, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. Way to fight back, Ahab. <laughs> then the messengers returned and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Surely I sent to you, saying, You shall give me your silver and your gold and your wives and your children. But about this time tomorrow I will send my servants to you, and they will search your house and the houses of your servants, and whatever is desirable in your eyes, they will take in their hand and carry away. We want it all. We're going to take it all. Part of the problem here is Ahab backed down so quick that Ben-Hadad figured, This guy's a pushover. 
I can get more than gold, silver, wives, and children. I can get anything I want. I'm sending to take whatever I want from this land. Well, then the king of Israel called all the elders, verse 7, of the land, and said, Please observe and see how this man is looking for trouble. For he sent for me, or to me, for my wives and my children and my silver and my gold, and I did not refuse him. Well, all the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. <laughs> get a spine, Ahab. So he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king all that you sent for to your servant. At the first I will do, but this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Ben-Hadad said to him, he came, said to him, he said, May the gods do so to me, and much more also, if the dust of Samaria will suffice for handfuls for all the people who follow me. In other words, I'm going to reduce your city to dust. I'm going to so wipe you out that there won't even be handfuls of people left. Well, then the king of Israel replied, verse 11, Tell him, let not, one who gird, let not him who girds on his armor boast like him who takes it off. In other words, don't boast of triumph until you have victory. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Verse 12, when Ben-Hadad heard this message, he was drinking with the kings in the temporary shelters, and he said to his servants, Station yourselves, so they station themselves against the city. I would just point out that every time someone is drinking, it's interesting how the scripture points it out and how it tends to play into their downfall. So verse 13, Now behold, a prophet approached Ahab, the king of Israel, and said, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver them into your hand today, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Ahab said, By whom? So he said, Thus says the Lord, By the young men of the rulers of the provinces. And then he said, Well, who shall begin the battle? And he answered, You. Then he mustered the young men of the rulers of the provinces, and they were a whopping 232. <laughs> and after them he mustered all the people, even all the sons of Israel, 7,000. And they went out at noon while Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the temporary shelters with the 32 kings who helped him. Clearly they were not concerned. The young men of the rulers of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out. And they told him, saying, Men have come out from Samaria. And then he said, Well, if they come out for peace, <laughs> take them alive. <laughs> they come out for war, take them alive. So these went out from the city, the young men of the rulers of the provinces and the army which followed them. They killed each his man. And the Arameans fled, and Israel pursued them. And then Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on a horse with horsemen. The king of Israel went out and struck the horses and chariots and killed the Arameans with a great slaughter. Awesome. Don't you love shutting up the big mouth? And that's exactly what happens here. They have paltry pack of 7,000 Jews go up against a massive confederation of Assyrian army, and they wipe them out. And God says, I'm doing this, Ahab, so that you will know that I am the Lord. I can even work through you. I got an article from uh, Clark Donald I thought was interesting. Story, rather, of a uh, Russian military academy where a general was giving a lecture on potential problems and military strategies for this new millennium. And at the end of the lecture, he asked if there were any questions, and an officer stood up and said, Will there be a third world war? And if so, who will be the enemy? Will Russia take part in it? The general answered both questions in the affirmative, and the officer asked again, okay, well, who will be the enemy? The general replied, all indications point to China. The audience was shocked. The officer asked, general, we are only 150 million here, and there are 1.5 billion Chinese. Can we win at all? Well, the general said, in modern war warfare, it's not the quantity that matters, but the quality. For example, in the Middle East of the past 60 years, we've seen several wars where fewer than 5 million Jews fought against 50 million Arabs, and Israel was always victorious. And after a small pause, the officer asked, sir, do we have enough Jews? <laughs> took them out there in the mountains of Samaria <laughs> completely drove them away but remember this is Ahab's Israel that we're talking about this is not the glorious Israel under the reign and command of Joshua coming into the promised land having learned their lesson trusting the Lord prayerfully following the Lord for their victory this is Ahab's wicked Israel and they wipe out the enemy 
This is the same Ahab who was leading Israel away from God to follow the idolatrous Baal. Well, did Ahab turn it around? Was he all of a sudden a worthy king who believes in God? Gang, the victory is not because of Ahab's changing loyalty. It's because of God's unchanging love. That the Lord, and listen to this, the Lord would look into the heart of a man like Ahab and say, I still want to save him. I still am going to pull out all the stops to find a way to get in this guy's face so he'll know that I'm the Lord, and in knowing that I'm the Lord, have his salvation. This is the heart of our Father. We talk about Father's Day. Let me tell you, the real heart of a father is a father who never, ever gives up on his children. And the Lord hasn't given up. There are a lot of friends and family members of ours, gang, who do not believe in Jesus, who we've given up on. God has not. And he won't give up until the very last breath he does not give up. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. That's the heart of the Father. I want you saved. By the way, side note, Revelation 3.20 is not spoken as an evangelical verse out to the, the lost in the world. It's spoken to the church. Jesus is saying, I'm standing on the door of the church and I'm knocking and wondering, are you going to let me in? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to follow me? Are you going to open the door so we don't suffocate? These are the things. Okay. But there's more to this story. Ahab and Israel now have won a, a great victory. They shouldn't have won with their paltry little band of, of Jewish guys fighting against the, the uh, Syrians in the mountainous, rough and rocky terrain of Samaria. Watch what happens. Verse 22. Then the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, Go, strengthen yourself, and observe, and see what you have to do. For at the turn of the year, the king of Aram will come against you. Now the servants of the king of Aram said to him, Their gods are gods of the mountains. Therefore they were stronger than we, but rather let us fight them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. And then Hadad said, Maybe so, but don't call me surely. <laughs> Just added that myself. <laughs> Verse 24, do this. <laughs> Do this thing, remove the, cap, the kings, each from his place, put the captains in their place, muster an army like the army that you have lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot, and then we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. And he listened to their voice, and he did so. Now, understand what they're saying. The Arab mans get wiped out, and they look at Israel and go, well, here's the problem. We fought them in the mountainous region of Samaria, and their gods are mountain gods. So we need to fight them in the valley, in the plain. That's where we can beat them. Why would these people, these Arameans, think that the gods were mountain gods? I'll tell you why. Two reasons. The temple of Jerusalem sat upon Mount Moriah in Israel. And so they would look at that and say, oh, God of the mountain. Great, glorious God of the mountain. All the people have to go up to Jerusalem to see their God. But there's another more unfortunate reason why the Arameans would think the people of Israel were people of mountain gods. And this is a tragic reason, because of the high places. The high places of idol worship that the outsiders were watching the insiders run to were all in the mountains. From an outsider perspective, and please don't miss this, I know the dog walked in and from an outsider's perspective, Israel looked like a polytheistic nation at this point. Because they were worshipping Asherah, and Baal, and Molech, and Hamash. They were worshipping all these gods, and Jehovah, over on Mount Moriah. And that's a problem, gang. When the outsiders, the non-believers, look inside... And they judge based on what they see, and they see all this mess going on in Israel, and they go, oh, they're just gods of the mountains. But their mountain gods are not going to be able to help them in the valley. Verse 26, going on, at the turn of the year, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. The sons of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went to meet them. And the sons of Israel camped before them like two little flocks of goats. But the Arameans filled the country. Those of you who have been to Israel, this place affects, this is a city in the valley called Jezreel or Megiddo. I want you to picture in your mind, if you can, if you have not been there, the, the valley of Megiddo is huge. 
It is massive. It is surrounded by various mountains, almost in, a, in kind of a circle around it. You can look down into this valley, and from the point of any of these mountains, look out from Mount Carmel, or from Nazareth, or from any of these other places, you can look out across this huge valley. And according to Scripture... The difference between these two armies was Israel looked like a couple little flocks of goats and the rest of the area was covered with Syrians. So it was a massive, massive threat as they are in this valley. Reading on, it says, A man of God, verse 28, came near and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, Because the Arameans have said the Lord is a God of the mountains, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So they camped one over against the other for seven days. And on the seventh day, the battle was joined, and the sons of Israel killed of the Arameans 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and the wall fell on 27,000 men who were left. And we have archaeological evidence of this. In the region where effect was, where the city was, there was a massive dig that, that discovered a wall that had fallen over. Under that wall would be then what was left of 27,000 men who were running away and God just said, nope. <laughs> one day, you military guys and girls listen to me, one day 127,000 people were taken out by the power of God even working through the people of Israel. It was a complete routing. The Valley of Megiddo, that's where many great battles have been fought. This is one of them. Many others have them there in the valley. Many will happen. One great one, we call it Armageddon, is going to happen in this same valley someday. But I want you to think about these two battles for a moment and consider what's going on here. The first battle fought in the mountains of Samaria. The second battle was waged in the Jezreel Valley and the Arameans miscalculated big time. Draw them into the valley. Bring them into the valley. Let's see if they can take a stand there. They're strong in the mountains because they got mountain gods. Get them into the valley and that's where we can go at them. It's one of the greatest miscalculations in military history. But gang, I'm not talking about Ben-Hadad. I'm talking about Satan. It is one of Satan's greatest miscalculations to think that if I can pull them off the mountain and get them into the valley, there I can take them out. Because he's just the God of the mountains, or they're at least just people who believe in a mountain God, not people who believe in a valley God. The devil continues even today to try and draw God's sheep into the valley. We've seen him do this across history. Job chapter 1 verse 8. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Well, Satan answered the Lord. And said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house for all he has on every side? You bless the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Take him into the valley, and he won't be such a righteous guy after all. Job went into the valley. If you've read and know his story, Job loses everything except for his wife. And there's probably a moment in the story where he wishes he had lost her. <laughs> all his children are taken from him. All his flocks, his herds, his riches, his wealth. He ends up in ashes, sitting on the ground with boils and sores all over his body. And he will not curse God, though he is in the depths of the valley. Jesus said about Peter in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Satan wants to take you down. But I have prayed for you. That your strength... I, let me stop there. Just to know that Jesus is praying for me. What a great thought. And we don't have to extrapolate from this verse because the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. So put yourself in Peter's sandals when Jesus says, Satan wants to go after you, Peter, but I pray for you. Boy, there's some confidence for you. I pray for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once again you have turned, strengthen your brothers. That night, Peter hit the valley. He watched his Lord taken from him. He heard his own lips utter denial three times, and he would watch Jesus crucified. And for three days, Peter would be low in the valley. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35 says, Some were tortured, 
not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. But Satan still would say, you Christians, (laughs) all that needs to happen for you to deny your God is to get you down off the mountain of your silly little Bible studies and your worship seminars and your retreats and your conferences. Man, just get you off the mountain. And I will meet you in the valley and you will deny your Lord. It's that easy. Now I want to inject because we got to go down to the valley for a few minutes this morning and I got to inject a note of sensitivity here just to say I know some of you are either in the valley right now or have very recently been through heavy duty valley experiences. And I'm thinking of some right now and I don't want to embarrass anybody by pointing people out. But don't think for a moment the Lord doesn't know where you've been or where some of us may be headed. Years ago, a young shepherd wrote these words. He said, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why is that, David? Because you're with me. You are with me. Doesn't matter how dark the valley gets. Doesn't matter how deep or how frightening. You are with me. Listen to what the Lord says in verse 28. Because the Arameans have said the Lord is a God of the mountains, but he is not a God of the valleys, therefore I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now here's what I want you to get. I don't have five points to this message. I got one. Understand this. The enemy thought they were the ones drawing Israel into the valley. In reality, it was God. We so quickly and easily like to blame the enemy when we go into the valley. But let me just suggest to you this morning that sometimes it has nothing to do with the enemy. Sometimes God himself is taking you down. Sometimes the Lord himself is leading you into that difficult place. I'm not talking about temptation to sin. God doesn't tempt anyone, nor does he lead people into temptation. But I'm talking about hard times. I'm talking about crises. I'm talking about tragedy and even places of dark despair. Sometimes our Lord will walk us right down into that valley. And we're going, Satan's after me, Satan's after me. And the Lord's saying, I brought you here. Why would he do that? Well, we need to understand he's not just the God of the mountains. He's the God of the valleys. In fact, he is everywhere. I told you I didn't want to bring this sermon this morning, but you've got to understand, this is not one about trying to encourage you if you've been through or are going through hard times or if you feel like you're walking in the valley. The victory at effect in the Jezreel Valley was for one purpose and one purpose alone. Listen to me. It was for showing the pagan Arameans that the Lord was God. It wasn't for showing Israel. It wasn't even at this point for proving it to Ahab. That was the first battle, the one in the mountains. The Lord said, I'm going to show you Ahab. But this time around, he says, because the Arameans have said this, (laughs) bring it on. I'm going to take you, Israel, into the valley. We're going to fight against them. And there you're going to see a great victory. You think I'm only God of the mountains? You think I'm only the God of your spiritual highs and your good times and the days when everything is going well? Guess again. Let's go to the valley. And there I will show you that I am God. What I'm saying here is the Lord doesn't only let his people wander into the valley. He leads his people into the valley. There are times where the valley experiences and even the depths of our despair, we have been led into that place by the Lord. Rick, can you back that up biblically? I think so. Turn to Exodus 14. Exodus chapter 14. (laughs) 
children of Israel, having escaped Egypt, are well on their way to the promised land. They are way out ahead of the Egyptian army. In fact, at this point, the Egyptian army is not pursuing them at all. It's a little different picture than the Charlton Heston version, you know, where they get out and, and almost immediately the army's right behind them. No, Israel is way out front, and if they just kept going, would have had no trouble from the Egyptian army that was at this point sequestered back in Egypt. Watch what happens in verse 1 of Exodus 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before, before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it, by the sea. Now if I was Moses, I'd be going, Excuse me? We're out here and you want us to go back? And not only do you want us to go back, but you want us to go camp between Pi and Hirop and Migdal, those two mountains and that little valley in between? And, 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 and that other spot there, Baal Zephon, and, and you want us with our backs to the Red Sea? After this location, being in the Middle East, there in Egypt, this location is a no way out situation. They weren't just going back toward Egypt. They were going back and then stuck in a place that they could not get out of. There was a narrow entry point into this area where all the children of Israel were. And the only way in or out of there was to somehow walk through a sea or walk back out the entrance that would be covered with the Egyptian army. God says to Moses in verse 3, For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. They weren't wandering aimlessly. They were headed for home. Everything was good. They weren't wandering aimlessly. They were led back to a place of despair by the Lord. Verse 4, he says, Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them. So <laughs> Pharaoh, again, is not even thinking about chasing Israel at this point. God sets that one up, too. And he says, And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. Watch this. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Who will know? Egypt will. Here's a new thought for you. The whole Red Sea thing was not for Israel. It was not to increase the faith of the Israelites. It was for Egypt to see God as God. The whole experience of the seas parting, I always thought, wow, that was so when they walked through, they'd go, yeah, he really is our God. They already knew that. They already understood that. They had already been rescued. The Red Sea was not for Israel. It was for Egypt. And Bible students, what is Egypt a picture of in the Bible? It's a picture of the world. Now put this thought together. The point of all of this, the point of God leading us into the valley, into difficult situations, and even into hardship, is not to increase our faith. It's so that the world might know that He is God. That the world would look and watch and see believers going through tough stuff, but having a peace that passes all understanding. And when they see that happen, they say, she's got something there. I, if that was me in that hard place, if I was the one in that valley, I'd be wiped out. But this person's walking with faith. I don't get it. What do you have? What's going on here? What am I missing? Wait a minute, Rick. Are, are you saying that God uses people? Yep. Okay, I brought a friend this morning to church hoping that they would believe in Jesus and get saved. That's not going to happen now. <laughs> because you're telling me that if I give my life over to God, He might mess it up just so that someone else can get to know Him? That is exactly what I'm telling you. And I'll tell you something, it's not preached enough in the church today. We're spending most of our time talking about our felt needs and our struggles and, and, our, and our focus is getting right here. When right outside of our peripheral vision is a world that is going to hell in a handbasket, and God cares about that. Let me just shock you and say God is not real concerned about your hangnails. God is not looking at your life and going, boy, I... Okay, I've got to be careful here because I think God is concerned about your hangnail. I think God does love you and He does care about you. And that does matter. And your life matters to Him. And He's with you. And remember, He goes into the valley with you. But what I'm saying is we put such a heavy focus on what God is doing for me. Instead of saying, God, why don't you just use me so someone else will get saved? Even if that means we go for a walk into the valley. Sometimes God will lead us into the valley for a greater purpose than our comfort 
or than our learning, or even than our faith. It's an interesting verse. Mark chapter 1, verse 12 tells us that after Jesus was baptized in that glorious moment, comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. The Father says, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And Oh, he's good to go for ministry. And Mark tells us, immediately the Spirit impelled him out into the wilderness. The word is literally drove. You don't see the Holy Spirit driving people, usually in Scripture. More often than not, the Spirit walks beside us. The word is paraclete in the Greek. He, he is the helper who comes with us and walks alongside us. He, he, he indwells us, or He comes upon us in power. But you rarely see the Holy Spirit driving someone. And yet Jesus was driven into the wilderness. But what for? Some ministry training? You know? <laughs> going to maybe meet with the apostles and you camp out? Well, 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 40 days and 40 nights, no food. Little or no rest. Attacked by Satan again and again and again. And let me tell you something. It wasn't so Jesus would be sure of his faith. The Father used his Son. Put his Son into that difficult position so that you and I would know he could handle it. So he could go through the testing and be sure. Which is why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18, Since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. I love that about Jesus. He gets me. We talked about Allah last week. Allah has never been a human. Well, Allah has never been, but that aside... <laughs> No other God put on human flesh and walked on this earth like Jesus did. And that is so significant because we can tell people Jesus gets it. God understands. He didn't just say He understands. He lived it out and understands. And He went through tough stuff just like us so that He can look at us and say, I understand. I know. I know it's hard. I've been there. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 he sa- it says we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin again this is not a felt needs message to make you feel better if you're going through hardship right now although the Lord is with you and he doesn't send you into the valley alone he goes with you because he's the God of the valley and that should bring great comfort But I believe the Lord wants us to wrap our minds around the larger and more important issue of eternity and the salvation of other human souls, especially if you are a saved person this morning. If you have given your life to Jesus and you are walking with the Lord and you know you have your salvation, guess what? Take that security, know that it's good, and turn your focus off of yourself and to a lost and dying world. That's where God's focus is. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, Don't fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And I never thought about it this way before, but when Jesus says this, don't fear those who can kill the body. He's saying, I believe, to the church, hey, don't worry about the persecutions. Don't worry even about losing your life. It's not a big deal. (laughs) It really isn't that big a deal because in terms of eternity... Guess what? You could die tomorrow for your faith in Jesus and you're home with Him. How can they hurt me? What is the worst Satan can do to me? I'm in the grasp of God and nobody can snatch me out of His hand, John chapter 10. So I'm good to go. Don't fear those who can kill the body. But, he says, fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And I believe that part of it, gang, is not for those who are believers in Jesus. It's for those who are not. You want to be afraid of something? Be afraid that there are people we know who as of this moment are going to hell. That's something to be afraid of. That's something to be concerned about. That's something to be in prayer about. Not, oh Lord, my finger hurts and my hand down. It is, Lord, Lord, my sister is in dire straits and needs Jesus. Last week my best friend... Chris Stevens lives down in Southern California. His mother died of cancer. In fact, just a couple, three days ago. And they watched her go, and she went very fast when, when it all really started to hit. And in those last few days, there was, there was question about where, where was her soul? Where was her faith? And, and 
at no surprise, Chris and his wife Diane, the major amount of the time that they spent with her was talking about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you understand his love for you? And just praying with her and, and wanting to be absolutely sure before she went that she was secure in the Lord. I'm happy to report that she was. But it's interesting to me where their focus was when all of a sudden time was running out. I think God wants to shake us loose of our comfort here so that we will recognize that time is running out. And it is time to not be afraid to speak the name of Jesus and to live for other people who need him instead of living for ourselves who already have him. He is a God who leads us into the valley if it will lead someone else to him. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Tim, you followed my teaching and my conduct and purpose and faith, my, pers- my patience and my love, my perseverance. And he says, when Timothy, you followed my persecutions and my sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, Paul says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many of us have been for our faith in the Lord? And Paul says, everybody who lives godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to face persecution. It's almost kind of a test to see how I'm living. (laughs) I'm being persecuted, but I know I'm doing something right. And if I'm not, and life is comfy and easy going, maybe I'm not doing something right. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I haven't been vocal enough about Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Why was Paul's life such a persecuted one? Well, someone would say, because the enemy hated him so much. Okay, I'll grant you that one. But it's also because the Father led Paul into valleys multiple times. Jesus said to, um, oh, what's his name? To, someone help me here, the guy who baptized Paul. None of us know. Ananias. Ananias, thank you very much. <laughs> totally. Whoop. We were about to have to go have a study about Ananias right there. So. Jesus said to Paul, or said to Ananias about Paul, he said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Now there's a thought. What? I'm going to lead this guy into ministry so I can show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Not for his sake. For my sake. What do you mean? Turning your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 for a moment. 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1. While you're turning there, Paul's life was a persecuted one because God led him into the valleys. Why would God do that? To show the world that he is the Lord. To show people through those struggles, through the shipwrecks and the beatings and the persecutions and the being kicked out of every town in the area, through the hardships and the stonings, that he would keep coming back again and again and again. And they could not shut this guy up. And what that did was show the world that the Lord is God. And the harder they railed on Paul, the more he preached the gospel. And so when he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, the second letter, he understood where they were at. This was a persecuted church, gang. In fact, the background on this letter is they were so persecuted that they thought they had entered into the tribulation and missed missed the rapture altogether. They were afraid that they'd missed it. And they were stuck now and going through the seven years of complete hell on earth. Listen to what Paul says. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus, that's Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of one uh, of each one towards one another uh, grows ever greater. He says, therefore... We ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. What does that mean? It simply means that their suffering proves that they have been judged righteous by God and the world hates them for it. So they're in a good place, even though they're in a bad place. You know, the church of Thessalonica is in the valley big time for their faith in God. Because they believe in it. And so everyone around them is pressing in and and there's great persecution. Going on, it says in verse 6, For after all, 
it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And to that I say, Amen. <laughs> Go get them, Lord. <laughs> and give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Dealing out retribution, yes, <laughs> to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take them down, Lord. <laughs> That is not the heart of Paul as he's writing this. He's not encouraging this persecuted people by saying, don't worry, God's going to kick them out. He's going to take them down. He's going to break their teeth. It's going to be awesome. (laughs) Paul is saying, if you're having hard times now, if the persecutions are difficult now, no worries. There's going to be a full accounting. You don't have to worry about repayment or retribution or getting people back. God's going to take care of all that. And the question is, well, when, when's he going to do that? Like today, tomorrow, because I could use some help right now. No, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not necessarily before. So you may get some persecution in your life. You may go through a valley and not understand it even until Jesus comes. Read on, verse 9. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. To this end we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, man, we are praying with you. And we're praying not that your suffering and persecution be taken away. Not that you will be pulled out of the valley. What we're praying is that as you go through it, you will be counted worthy to be persecuted. To what end, Paul? The glory of God. That the world will see you in your hardship and say, praise God. There is a God. And He is the Lord. The world needs to see the glory of Jesus in you, that they may know that He is God. Eternity is serious business. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, is He saying what I think He's saying? The answer is yes. I am. God will use us. Those who have given their lives to Him, He will use us for this basis of saving other people. Now, here's the good news, because we don't like the idea of someone using us for their own ends. Here's the good news. When someone else uses us, it tends to kind of wipe us out. The more God uses you, the stronger you get. The more time you spend with Jesus in the valley, the better your relationship with Him. He says we are being changed from glory to glory. Not from glory to little used up, puny little human vessels who are going to be so wiped out and tired by the time He gets here, we won't even know heaven if it hits us in the face. No. From glory to glory. I am going to take you into the valley. And it's going to be hard. And I'm not necessarily doing it for you. I'm going to do it because those around you need to see me. And understand my glory. And know that I don't leave you alone. Even in those hard places. And my friends, he's not asking anything of us that he didn't do himself. Maybe that's the bigger key. He sent his own son. God used Jesus so that we could know He is God. Jesus didn't go to the cross for Himself. He went to the cross for you and for me. It was 100% an others-centered event. But like Israel, outnumbered like two little flocks of goats today. In fact, Jesus, the Lamb of God, He came out the other side of the valley of the shadow of death, victorious. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 says, Consider Jesus who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. So let me ask you this. Do you understand? Do we really know what we're saying when we say, Lord, make me like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus. Really? Because if you do... He'll take you to the cross. He will take you to the valley. Jesus went into the valley. The Cadron Valley. As he walked down through that valley and across to the Garden of Gethsemane on the other side. And there he prayed and prayed, Lord, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he would walk back across this valley, chained up by Roman guards, followed by his Jewish accusers. 
and they would take him overnight through those various trials. He would end up crucified on the cross. Jesus went into the valleys to save us. And now, honestly, God's not asking us to do anything else. Are you willing to go into the valleys that means saving someone else? Are you willing to give up your comfort and your, your ease of life if it means that someone can be saved by it? Or are we so focused in our American world with our stuff that we're of no use to the Father at all? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.11, We who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Since death works in us, so death works in us, but life in you. Man, Paul would say, take me out if it will save you. Kill me if it will save you. He even went so far as to say, I would give up my eternity with Jesus if Israel could be saved for it. That's intense. And God's not asking anybody to give up eternity. What he is saying is, are you willing to walk into the valley together? Because that's where the, the world will see that I'm not just the God of the mountains. I am the God of the valleys. Paul said in Philippians 3, 7, what other things, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Loss. And he wasn't talking about losing a favorite shirt or not being able to get home in time for the ball game. He was talking about serious loss. Some of you, by following Jesus, may find yourselves losing all manner of things. You might lose a friend. You might lose a house. You might lose some material stuff. But you know what? The further into the valley you go with Jesus, the better it gets. And the less all that temporary stuff matters because your mind gets focused on the eternal if you went through the Revelation study with us a couple of years back, you know that during the first 282 years of the church's existence, the persecution was unbelievable. Rome saw to the martyrdom of upwards of 7 million Christians. In the first 60 years alone, it is thought that as many as 3 million Christians were martyred when the church first began. That was the world into which God birthed the church. But a saying that came out of that time is the blood of the martyrs is seed. The more you kill us, the more Father is going to grow the kingdom. That was the attitude of the early church. Not whether or not we could get air conditioning in the barn. Not whether or not the seat was a little uncomfortable. The early church was like, okay, my brother and my uncle are right now dipped in hot wax and burning alive in Nero's garden. I will stand up for Jesus even if that's where I end up. That's faith. That's trusting the Lord, even in the valley. And so Jesus wrote in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, to the church at Smyrna, which is a prophetic picture of the church of this time, this martyred church, he said, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. And I think, well, Lord, if you know the devil's going to do it, stop him. Just don't let him, and we'll all be good. And Jesus says, No, it is going to happen. But if you will be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. That's the promise. What will the world say when they see you in the valley? Will they say, ah, Yahweh's just a God of the mountains. He's good for camps and retreats. Or will they say, He truly is God? Now, I, I know some of you might be saying right now, Rick, you're scaring me. I don't want to go in the valley. Neither do I. I didn't want to preach this sermon this morning. I read through this over and over, and I asked God yesterday, could you give me a different one? <laughs> it's a little easier, because if I preach this, I know what I'm saying. That's a setup for me, for my family, for my life. Corey Ten Boom said, there is no deep soap pit. <laughs> there is no pit so deep. I've done this twice, okay? Sometimes at the end. There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. Great quote. She said, you'll never know Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. I love that. And so, my friends, the Lord may lead us directly into the valley, as he did with Israel against Ben-Hadad and the Arameans that day. And it may be through personal loss, personal hardship, 
You can lose a job, lose a friend, lose a family, lose a home, lose your comfort, and for some of you, possibly even your life. But know for certain, He is both God of the mountains and God of the valleys. He is God in both places. May He be glorified wherever we are. Amen? Let me read one final verse to you. David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One last thing. I, you know, I said I wasn't going to name any names. I lied. I just need to say before all of you as a fellowship that the faith that I've seen in Ben and Joanna Shook over the last several months. That is faith in the valley. That is trusting God when it's dark and difficult. Now, I don't believe the Lord would want either of you to feel the pain and the struggle that you've had to go through, but I'll tell you something. People have been looking at the two of you, and they have been seeing the glory of God. That's what we're talking about. Let's pray together. If you have the courage and the boldness to pray this prayer, then pray it after me to the Lord. Father, use me. Lord, whatever it takes to save people, use my life. I give you complete control. I abdicate my authority. And I ask only that you will be with me in the valley. Father, I ask, will you bless this prayer? And will you lead us and keep us, Father, secure in the knowledge of our salvation, trusting always in Jesus? But Father, it does frighten us, but we still say, use us. However you see fit, whatever you have to do, if it will save one more person, if it will bring one more lost lamb into the fold, then use us, Lord, to your greater glory. And we look forward to the day when we are all together at home before the throne, praising you and having no memory of the pain that we have to go through sometimes in this life. Father, I pray that you will bless this fellowship and work out your will through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up together.